everybody. How are you all doing today? Hello, everyone. Welcome, Deborah. I've been looking forward to our session today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here. And I've been looking forward to it, too. I'm excited. <laughs> me too. Me too. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. So today we are going to talk a little bit about yourself and we are then going to explore the topic that we have chosen for today, which is how to create anti-boring content. So let's get started right away, Deborah. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Who are you? What do you do? What's your story? Sure thing. So as you know, my name is Deborah, and um, I grew up in Maryland, USA. I grew up right outside Washington, DC. And I began writing as a young child. My grandmother had given me this book of poetry for kids. And I just lost myself in this book and trying to write my own poems. And my first poem ever was about a cat on a mat because there was a lot of easy rhyme in there. <laughs> so anyway, so my love of writing and words started early. I wasn't even thinking about a career or anything like that. And then flash forward many years, I was in grad school for, for, um, to earn a creative writing graduate degree and studying poetry, which I realize now is a wonderful thing to have studied for what I do now. And I was teaching at the University of Florida as part of my graduate program. And while I, um, to help with, you know, to help pay my bills and so on, I had an additional job in addition to teaching, which was working as a copywriter in the Florida gift fruit industry. So I like to joke around that I came up with 57 different ways to describe an orange. <laughs> um, and it was such a good training ground for me because some of the challenges that I faced there as a writer have really helped me even until today with teaching people how to write content, writing my own content and so on. Wow. So literally 57 different ways how to describe an orange. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I didn't count them up, but there were all these different ways that, you know, I was a catalog copywriter for the gift fruit industry. So imagine catalogs that show up at your house around Christmas time and, you know, how, you know, how can an orange or grapefruit or whatever it is be described differently so that it seems appealing. And we would think up you know, benefits of different varieties of oranges. And before this, I never really, before I worked there, I never really thought about how many varieties of oranges there are. An orange is an orange, right? An apple is an apple. But here in the US, we have jazz apples, honey crisp, you know, there's all these different, golden delicious, there's all these different varieties of apples that are all good for different kinds of reasons. Some are better for pies, some are better for eating by hand, and so on. So it's, just, it's similar with oranges. There was one orange that had what, was referred to as a zipper skin, which meant that it was easy to peel. So this became the so-called benefit of the orange, which I think is kind of funny to, to think about, like we think of benefits as far as what we sell in our businesses, as coaches, as consultants, but we don't always think about what's the benefit of a certain type of fruit. <laughs> but the benefit of this one fruit was that it had a zipper skin. So that was one of the things that I wrote about. And then just coming up with different ways that they tasted, you know, uh, this one has a floral flavor or, or so on. And all of that really helped me because it was a challenge to come up with so many different ways to describe something and to make it seem fresh and to make it seem new each time. Um, there's, a, there's a poet who said, make it new when it comes to your writing, which I think is so important because for anyone who's struggled to write about their topic and felt like they're running out of ideas, this idea of making it new can really help you start to see what you do and examine it from different angles and write about it in different ways. And, and it can make creating your content fun again. Mm. So if, if you want our content to be orange delicious, then you are the best person to learn it from. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. We're talking about zipper skins. I think we call them sweet peelers. What do we call them? Easy peelers here. We call them easy peelers here in the UK. Nice. But then, yeah. yeah. But then there are so many varieties amongst easy peelers as well. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Definitely. There's so many different varieties in general. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. So, um, so I don't know. Did you want to know how I came into doing this work beyond just landing in it during grad school? Or would you like me to talk a little bit more about that? Oh, it's your moment. Tell us whatever you want. <laughs> sure. So, um, so working as a copywriter helped me 
get through grad school without having a lot of debt, which was nice. So it was kind of hard to juggle the different jobs, but it was also really good as far as that went. And so I kind of got the marketing writing bug early on and I began to see, hmm, this is a way that I can use a skill I have and do something I enjoy. But oddly, I didn't really work as, you know, I didn't have the job title of copywriter after that. I worked in direct mail marketing in the United States and we did a lot of direct marketing, um, direct mail packages to fundraise for US nonprofits. So um, the Central Park Conservancy, which helps keep Central Park healthy and functioning, that was one of them. Habitat for Humanity, which helps people build houses for those who can't afford their own house. So we worked for a lot of organizations like that, helping them fundraise through the mail. And I really loved it because the copy was my favorite part. I didn't write the copy, but I was always reading it. And that's where I learned how important story was because we were often sharing the stories of say, the Smiths and what it was like before they had the house and what it was like after they had the house. And then I had the opportunity to go to Georgia to, um, it's actually the same county where the former president Jimmy Carter lives because he started Habitat for Humanity with somebody else, I believe, if I recall correctly. And um, he wanted to eliminate um, homelessness in his county in Georgia. So anyway, we went down there and built houses and the people who would eventually own the house work with us on it. So that itself is a story. And then there's just the story of, of the family who was able to receive this house. And once you have a house, you can begin building a life, like it's easier to get a job, it's easier to take care of yourself when you know that you have a warm place to go home to. So anyway, all of that tied together, I realized through that particular job, the importance of stories to be able to communicate the effects of something and how something could really impact yourself if you're the buyer or impact someone else if you're donating to an organization. Yeah, and I'm sure one thing that was common amongst all these jobs, all these clients that you serve was your content could never be boring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Because I think what happens is some of what keeps it from being boring is that it's speaking directly to someone's heart or to... Um, and then additionally to an issue they're having or something that they want to help accomplish, whether it's for themselves or it's for someone else. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so tell us a little bit about how can we start ensuring that our content never ends up in the boring category. I know you mentioned speaking to people's hearts, but, uh, but how can we do it, say, when we are writing or posting content on social media? Yeah, I think one of the things, I'm going to talk a little bit about something that I see. I like to just do scans of content I don't mean like with software, but I mean with my eyes and hands. And I'll go through and I'll look at what people are doing with their content. And it kind of gives me an idea of what's landing with me and what isn't. And that helps me see what people are doing and not doing. One of the things that I see a lot of people doing that I think could possibly stop is sharing content from large conglomerate media companies. So sharing a Forbes article, sharing a Harvard Business Review article, while I love those publications, it's really not helping the coach or the consultant too much to share something like that. I think it's something people do when they're not sure what to write about. So I wanted yeah. to invite people, instead of sharing, consider creating some of your own content so people can really get to know you instead. Now, one exception to that is if you have a friend, a colleague, um, a service provider, a coach, and you've used their services and you want to recommend them, then of course it makes sense to share their content. I do that. Um, that's different because they're not like, they're not a big media conglomerate or something like that. Um, and they probably could benefit from your kind words aimed in their direction. <laughs> um, so, so that's one thing. And so then when we have that out of the way and we think, oh, now I have to create content, we begin to think about, well, who are we writing this for? Mm -hmm. So sometimes you know, I've taught college level English classes. And we always started with the audience. Who are you actually writing for? And what that ends up helping you do is knowing what to write about and how to talk about it. So if you're writing to doctors, let's say, let's say you coach doctors, um, there's certain terminology you wouldn't have to define for them versus if you were, if you were writing to non-doctors, you could use more medical terminology. In fact, you would probably want to because they would appreciate that. But an audience who wouldn't understand that, you wouldn't use the same kind of medical terminology. So that's one example of why we need to know very clearly who our audience is. And the other thing I invite people to do is go beyond profession. Sometimes we get stuck in profession. You know, we'll say, I help doctors, I help lawyers, I help practice owners, 
I help bankers. But, um, but we can also look at how people think, which in marketing speak is called psychographics. I like to call it soft facts about people, but it's really about what problems are they having? What is it that worries them about what you do? And, you know, um, for instance, sometimes with people I work with, they feel some self doubt. So that's something that I end up writing about the mindset to be able to create content, how to overcome self doubt, things like that. So when you know more about what's causing some of their issues, then you're able to provide content that really speaks to those issues. And it also can inform any programs or coaching that you're offering as well in order to help them um, move forward and, and keep taking continual steps in the right direction for them. Mm. Yeah, I love what you said about sharing content. I see so many coaches sharing content from, say, the, the big names in the industry. So people would share content from somebody like Tony Robbins or other such successful coaches and there's nothing wrong with that it's just that when i see that i think it is adding i feel that i'm getting to know tony's work more and not that mm -hmm. individual coaches work more so if if they are doing this just for the sake of information or sharing information because they appreciated that piece of information it works but it does very little to their own branding or creating their own credibility so so i'm completely with you on that yeah, and uh, I think a related example is if we've studied with someone that we liked a lot, sometimes people get, it's fine to mention that person, but sometimes people get into where they're just, that's all they're talking about. And like you said, it, it ends up being a way for that person to hide as opposed to, like they are helping that other person, which is great, but they're yeah. sort of hindering themselves. And yeah. it's interesting because there's one, there's one um, person that I followed in the space and it was interesting because she was a pretty big deal by herself but she kept mentioning a person who was better known than her and then eventually she kind of came clean and, and and said to everyone hey i've been doing this thing where i've been mentioning this other person instead of myself and i and i thought well yeah i've been seeing that for a while now <laughs> but it was interesting that she sort of she sort of realized out loud and shared that with people and so i don't know if she ended up making a shift in her business or not but it it began to seem a little odd after a while that she was always talking about this other person because I thought I knew who the other person was, but I wasn't as interested in what they did. I was more interested in the person I wanted to hear from because I'd signed up for her email list and her stuff. And then she kept talking about this other person. And so I kind of drifted away for a while. And then when I drifted back, she wasn't doing it as much. Yeah. 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 I have seen the opposite happen as well. So there are people who would who had been writing original content, talking about their programs and how they can serve the community. And then they went on to talk about these big names. And that was a shift, which I'm sure it was part of their strategy, but it just didn't work for me because then I was thinking, well, I can actually go and follow Tony Robbins myself. I mean, Tony is just, just a name I'm using because he's so big in the coaching industry. And I like what he does, so I have nothing against him. But I was thinking, if I have to follow him, I can do that directly. You don't need to help me do that. You don't need to facilitate. And I just want to follow your content. I want to get to know you. And that piece was missing. And I think so many people just, just miss that bit out, mm -hmm. which is such Definitely. a shame. Yeah, it is such a shame. There's one thing, and there's one thing people can do to sort of stand out is you don't no one has to directly call anybody out in order to do what i'm about to describe but there's some ways that you can stand out as yourself which is to take a stand that might not be as popular in your industry but explain why so i'll give a brief example and mine did not directly name anybody but mine was basically about um there was i think it's shifting now but when it came to writing books or creating books which is what i used to focus on helping people do people would talk about becoming a bestseller. And the strange thing about that is that becoming a bestseller on Amazon just involves gaming the algorithm as of this present day, maybe it will change in the future. So becoming an Amazon bestseller is not that hard to do. Now becoming a New York Times bestseller, it's harder to game that algorithm, although I suppose it may be possible. But, but uh, so anyway, so the bestsellers are not all created equal, but a lot of people would have on Amazon in their headline, they're a bestseller, they're an Amazon uh, bestseller. But did that translate into any sales? Did it translate into business growth? It was just this label. So what I did is I kind of broke it down. Meanwhile, there was this other person who had taken a picture of his foot 
turned it into a PDF, made that into an Amazon ebook, so to speak, and then made the PDF of a picture of his foot become an Amazon bestseller to prove the point that it didn't really mean a whole lot. So I decided to say like, I don't believe in becoming a bestseller. I didn't even mention Amazon, but I didn't believe in becoming a bestseller because I didn't really think what I, what I believed in was creating a book that would truly help your business and help you get more business, help you create authority and credibility and so on. So that kind of helped me stand out. And it also helped me get people who weren't looking to game the system. And that's kind of, those are the kinds of people that I wanted to work on. So it kind of helped me as a business owner, be able to uh, filter people out who might want something yeah. different. And then it also allowed me to stand out from all the people who are like, become a bestseller, but they weren't really telling the full story yes. of how that that wouldn't really translate into book sales. It was just into gaming a system. So Yeah, yeah. And being able to take a different stand definitely requires courage because you are okay to say that, no, this is what I do. This is how I do things differently. And lots of people are going to appreciate that. Definitely. They will appreciate the fact that you are honest and that you're explaining things to them. It also gives them a chance to see a little bit of your style. So, cause you are kind of doing a little bit of teaching. You're yep. also gathering a little bit of data and making it interesting. So they're able to see how you handle those kinds of things. And also the way you deal with it. Do you sound mm -hmm. like a victim? Do you sound like you're complaining? They're also going, to, or do you sound like, Hey, I'm just letting you guys know this cause I'm serving you. They'll get a sense of how you go about doing that and that will allow yeah. them to take a step forward or take a step back. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's so important. Nobody, nobody likes to read victimy kind of content all the time. <laughs> all yeah. that trauma. Yeah. We don't need too much of it. Yeah. That's another one of the tips I have for people is that when sometimes I work with people who haven't, who are trying to write about something they haven't yet processed and there is, a space to write about that when you're writing for yourself in order to help process any trauma or anything that happened. Uh, but there's a point at which it can then, you know, with the passage of time and healing, it can then be turned into content should you wish that to happen yeah. if it serves your audience. But if you're still going through it, it ends up not really serving anyone because it's upsetting to the people reading it and it becomes more like trying to get therapy in the open air versus being something that really helps someone else. Um, and I think that sometimes people do that because they think that that's what they're supposed to do, but it can end up repelling people from you. And it can also result in a lack of trust overall that, um, especially if you're in a helping profession. So, mm -hmm. but just something to keep in mind. I think those stories can be powerful when it ties into the business and when, it, and when there's a resolution, you can say, here I was in the belly of the whale with things going wrong, but then I came out the other side and, you, and then you describe how that happened and so on. Yeah, that's such, a, such an important point that you have brought up, Deborah. This is a question I get asked constantly because people want to do their stories, they want to share their stories, personal stories to build their business, but getting that balance right, how to, how to be vulnerable enough to create connection but not be so vulnerable that, that people think, oh, you've lost your shit. <laughs> mm -hmm. How do we get that balance right? So, so thank you for bringing that up. Yes, I love the point that you say about sharing stories, sharing content when you have healed from it. Don't try and, do, don't try and uh, take therapy out in the open. It's, it's dangerous. It can, it can go wrong easily. Yeah. Definitely, definitely, yeah. I think also as far as stories and origin stories, we see a lot of the rags to riches stories out there. And I've been questioning that in my own head recently. Mm -hmm. And I've written about it privately and eventually I'll write about it and, and, and share more of my opinion once I kind of work through how I think about it. But I think that that's something to think about if, if you really have to have a rags to riches story or not, because that sort of came from this internet marketing kingdom, so to speak, that sort of trickled down and then told all of us how to run our businesses. But there, if you get outside of sort of the internet marketing kingdom, I'll call it, you can see that there are other business owners that have different kinds of stories and those stories can work well too. And that the rags to riches story also might not really resonate with the teller. And so it's good to think about that. I mean, I guess technically we could all say we have them and we could find you know, we could find something from our lives that would support that. But I, but I found myself resisting it because I just kept seeing so many of them. 
And mm -hmm. I just thought I wanted to do something a little bit different. And I also, I also believe that we may have more than one story. We do need to probably share one or else it starts to confuse people. But I do yeah. think that we probably have more than one version of a story or even more than one story that we could share that kind of shows our progression to how we came where we are and how we're serving people. And it doesn't always need to be the rags to riches. So. Yeah. So why do you reckon there is so much fascination with this rags to riches story in the world, especially in, in the virtual world? Well, I think one of the reasons is that the internet marketing kingdom was created to get people big wins and make money overnight and become a millionaire. And those are very appealing marketing messages to people who are trying to start a business. So when I hear those messages, I want to look outside of that kingdom and then look at who are other people who started businesses who had never heard of the, these internet marketing folks. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of business owners out there who don't do that. Like even in your own communities, if you, uh, I mean, unless you're in a very rural place, but in a lot of communities, you can look at business owners who never subscribe to the internet marketing kingdom and um, which is just my own terminology for what I'm talking about. But like, there's a lot of service providers, you know, dentists, medical practices, uh, PR agencies. There's lots of people doing things that, you know, follow uh, simple and valid marketing and business building principles and, and, um, having those rags to riches stories were not necessary for them in order to build a successful business. And so I would say that that would apply to everyone. No one has to have a story like that. And I think it, and to answer your question more precisely, I think it appeals to people because then they can, they can slap themselves into that and say, Oh, this person took this path and now they're driving the Maserati. So maybe I can drive the Maserati <laughs> too. But what they don't know is that the car has been rented. The yacht has been rented. The model has been rented. And even the cookies on the tray weren't really baked by the model who's presenting them. So, <laughs> and the photographs. So I just feel like it's just like a lot of fakey fakeness and it's not a lot of real, um, mm -hmm. it's not a lot of realness. There's actually this Facebook ad. I don't, I don't remember who it was run by, but he, he was making fun of people who show their Maseratis and their, you know, fancy stuff. And he was in his basement and he's like, here's my kitchen. And he shows his child's pink play kitchen. He's like, here's my kitchen. I want you to be impressed by it. And then he's like, and here's my sports car. And it's like a plastic sports car that belongs to his kids. <laughs> he's like, it's a little too small for me to sit in, but we're going to get that fixed. I don't know. He just went around his basement, just like pretending like it was a fancy house and, uh, and just laughing about like what other people do. And it like really stood out because people watching that video understood what he was doing. It was very funny. <laughs> yeah. Oh, what a brilliant ad, I would say. What a brilliant ad. Yeah. I think more and more people are getting, a, are able to see the truth in, in these rags to riches stories. And uh, as a business owner, I, I would like to say that, well, is it absolutely impossible that rags to riches doesn't happen? Well, it is possible, but maintaining that on a consistent basis would require more than just luck or or a fluke so so yes somebody may this happens when people start businesses a lot of times people would get a couple of clients and they would say oh we have cracked it but i think the the key is to be able to do that on a consistent basis because sustainability and consistency is the key to anything really mm -hmm. i definitely agree and I think there's a lot that can be learned from looking at various business models and seeing which one fits for you. And then sometimes I've, um, sometimes I've seen like where there might be people are jumping into something that might not, like they saw somebody else do it who's further along in business and then they jump into trying to do something, but they don't realize that person's actually further along in business. Yeah. I've seen that a lot where like there might be someone who, appears to be by themselves running their business, but they're not really mentioning they have a team of 10 or 20 people behind the scenes who are making things run. And that was something I ran into years ago with this. I, I followed some guy, you know, some marketer guy. And, and I was like, oh yeah. And then I kind of found out he had this whole team. And I was like, there's no way that I can do what he does. But he was kind of teaching as though like any of us could just do it. But I was a solopreneur at the time. And I was like, I don't have that many people working for me and it's actually not possible I can't write 2000 word blog posts and spend all day trying to optimize them and uh, for search engines. So it was, uh, he had, you know, he had people who wrote his posts for him and all that kind of thing. So that's why I feel like it's always wise to see who you're watching and just realize what is it that they have in the background 
um, because they might have advantages that you don't just because they're further along in business. It doesn't mean they're bad people. It just means that like they've kind of forgotten what it was like to be at the starting point. Yep. And then they kind of forget possibly. I mean, I don't, it doesn't seem to me like someone's doing this to be evil necessarily. It's just that like, they're like, yeah, I have this team of 10. Like they, it's no big deal to them. So they don't even think to mention it half the time. Yeah. So. No, you are so correct on that. I remember that a few months ago, I, I was in a conversation and I said to them that, oh, I'm a one person team in my business. And then I said, oh, hold on. But I have somebody who does my accounts and uh, bookkeeping, that side of things. I have somebody who, who does marketing and Facebook ads for me. All I do is talk to people and deliver and, and create my content. So no, I'm not a one person team. I, I have somebody who does my branding and my website. So, so yeah, I'm not a one person team actually. I have a team behind me. It's just that I don't have anyone on my payroll. That's a different thing, but I have a consistent team. So I'm not doing this all by myself and I don't even have to feel lonely and think, oh, I don't have anyone to, to support me. And obviously I have my coaches who help me move forward. So, so yeah, it is really, really important to, to have that perspective. Yeah. I look at it. Uh, I always see things visually. And so I like to think of it as like, you know, if we're kind of in the sense, like if we're a statue or something, we have this framework around us. I was just at the Jefferson Memorial in DC and like they've got all the scaffolding up because they're doing some fixes. But I kind of feel like, you know, we have the scaffolding around us and that's helping us get better. And then we're kind of like in the center, kind of running things that we want to be running. And then the, there's a scaffolding of like, um, you know, we might be in a group program with a coach or working one-on-one -on -one or have a business strategist or have virtual assistants who help us with any variety of tasks that they're better at than we are. And that's really helpful. And then we have like our business pals who help encourage us and so on. So I think there is a lot there that we all, like no one really can do it alone. At least, I mean, you can start alone, but after a while, like you're going to need people for different things to help yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah, we are going to need work colleagues, we need cheerleaders, we need fans, we need clients. Yes, yeah, so we just don't need clients only. We need all the other roles in our lives and businesses. Exactly, exactly. Mm. So I have a couple writing resources or writing ideas to share if people feel stuck. Is this a good time I can let people know? Yes, please. So the first one is if you're, if you're looking to create stories, I think that this is a lovely book. This, these, these, I've, I picked a few books out of here and they're purposely ones that have nothing to do with marketing, sales, or copywriting, because okay. I think that these are undervalued. The first one is Kate DiCamillo and it's called The Tiger Rising. This, mm. you can see how thin this book, it's actually for children, but it's a very quick read at, um, at about 121 pages. And I love this first sentence. Listen to this first sentence and how this, because this, this applies to content and we can learn a lot from reading really good books like this. That morning, after he discovered the tiger, Rob went and stood under the Kentucky Star Motel sign and waited for the school bus just like it was any other day. There's so much in there because he discovered a tiger? What? What? <laughs> So it's like, you're already really curious. So think about that when you're creating your content, like how can you evoke curiosity in people to want to keep, you know, to make them want to keep reading in your yeah. very first line. The second thing is so subtle, but it's, but it, it'd be easier if you were reading it, you would probably see it right away. But since I'm reading it out loud, people might not have noticed, but he waited for the school bus. And here's the important part, just like it was any other day. So we're also wondering, wait, why isn't this like any other day? Anyway, you have to go read the book because it's amazing and it's very short and beautifully written. And I think that people can learn a lot from it as far as good writing goes. So I just wanted to mention that one. And then there's um, this other one was gifted to me by a ghostwriter who writes for a lot of celebrities. And I took a ghostwriting retreat with her many moons ago and she gave me this book and it's by um, Anne Morrow Lindbergh, who I think is related to the person who created the balloons but you guys might know her, but it's called Gift from the Sea. Again, this has nothing to do with marketing, sales, or content writing per se, but it's just her, it's sort of like semi journals about the beach and the sea and her descriptions of things. So describing things is so important. Describing the outcomes people get, describing what it's like working with you, 
if you're, you know, one day when we can travel again, you might want to sell a retreat and want to describe what that looks like. Anytime you have to describe stuff, this is a great book to read just to get some inspiration, Gift from the Sea. So I just wanted to share those two because they might not be something that people come across on their journeys. Um, they're not the books that like everybody talks about, but I think that they're yeah. so important and they're really valuable for becoming a really good content creator. Brilliant. I'm going to add these to my list of readings as well. Will you also drop these names just underneath this video when we finish? Yes, definitely. Okay, thank you. So tell us, Deborah, what else can we do to make sure that our content isn't boring? Well, one thing that can be quite fun is to go watch on Netflix some of the shows that people are talking about and then to look at it in terms of the storytelling, which I think is so important. So The Queen's Gambit is a great example of this. You're always left on a cliffhanger at the end of every episode and you're like, what's gonna happen next? And that's why we watch 15 of them in a row. Um, that's how this whole concept of binge watching came along. So if you want people to sort of binge watch or binge read your content, think about what that cliffhanger is and how you can then take them, you know, where, where's a wise place to leave them where they have resolution to part of it, to part of what's going on, but you're leaving a little bit to the next time. Um, and so that way you're constantly, um, one, one time I was talking with a novelist on a retreat I was on and she was saying, uh, at the time I was working on a mystery and she's like, isn't every novel a mystery novel? And I was like, I guess it is. I hadn't thought about it that way, but there is always this mystery, even if it's not talking about like a Hitchcock, Agatha Christie type mystery. But, um, but we're, we're constantly resolving some of the information while leaving some to the next time until the whole story is complete. That's constantly happening throughout, throughout stories. So I invite you guys, the next time you're watching something, Queen's Gambit, The Crown, whatever you want to watch, um, to, to see that that's happening in the shows and the movies too that you watch. Hunger Games, Harry Potter, it's all, you'll, Star Wars, you'll see it all the time. Star Wars actually is a great example. Of, of a movie series to watch in order to see great storytelling. So, so um, infusing yourself with great storytelling, but thinking about why the story works while you watch it, not just watching it passively, can really help you become better in your own writing. Because what it all comes down to is that we, we're sort of, we wanna entertain people while we're educating them as to the next wise step for them. Now, some people are like, well, I haven't fought off Darth Vader lately, so what am I supposed to write about? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't have a Voldemort, what do I do? So you can just pick stories from your everyday life. And it doesn't matter if you, you don't have to travel to Paris and have your picture taken in front of the Eiffel Tower. You don't have to do these kinds of things. You can really just pick up stories from everyday life. Now, if you're out on a walk, for instance, then just observe things and see what's around. Like, is the grass turning brown? Does your neighbor have something new in front of their house? Is your neighbor doing something in front of their house that looks kind of strange or did they greet you? Um, did you have a conversation with them? Did you notice something about the cars driving by? Was the sky doing something weird? Was it a weird color because of, you know, dust that came from a desert somewhere like happened to us over the summer so um so you can just kind of think about those things and just be observing in a way that you haven't before and sometimes stories can come out of these different moments of observation mm. yeah that's that's such a powerful way to create content in my case i create my content every day so i'm not somebody who would write it for a week i know that approach works for some people but but I do it every day. And the reason I do it every day is because I pick up the idea from what has happened in my life right then in the last 10 hours, 12 hours, or yeah. that morning. That's how it works for me. So, so yes, thank you for that. That's really powerful. That's really powerful. Okay, I have a specific question for you, Deborah. Considering that a lot of our audience, they are coaches, how do we strike the balance between sounding coachy and still getting a point across. Ah, well, I think you hit the nail on the head with something you just mentioned, which is documenting our own journey and our lives as we go along. And I think that that's actually so smart and lovely to do, uh, like things we're thinking, things we're learning and so on. So I think as far as that coachy language, I think, I think some of it can get eliminated or it's easier to use more specific language when you, 
deeply know your audience and what their concerns are because most likely your audience is not saying, I need to stand in my power. I need to reach my full potential. So, you know, as coaches, we've learned, I've, you know, I took coach training. I'm familiar with coach world. And I know that those types of phrases come into people's copy quite a bit. And so then I'll ask them, so what does it mean really to stand in your power for what you do? Because if you're a health coach and this person is uh, like an addiction coach and this person's a mindset coach and they're all helping people stand in their power, how are they different from each other? Like, what are you really doing? So I think getting really clear on the outcomes that we help people achieve, like whether someone helps them um, be able to run a marathon or effectively you know, manage their team better than they did before if they're an executive coach, helping them figure out what that real true outcome is for that person that is then tied back to, to their audience's concern will help them use more specific language in their content. That is such an important point, Tebra. I see this problem even more and in large proportions when, when people talk about spirituality. And a lot of times that language becomes so fluffy that I don't even know what it means really and mm -hmm. and phrases like this one the the examples that you cited stand in your own power reach your full potential and 10 years ago when i wasn't a coach when i didn't when i wasn't a part of the world that i am now I, it they would make no sense to me i mean <laughs> they would yeah. sound good but but they couldn't get me as a client right yeah just on the basis of that language yeah, and it's hard to see because the person is so, so wants to help people and they just can't articulate it that well. And, you know, sometimes, like I'll invite people when I have my, um, when I have my content writing sprint, I'll invite people to think about this question. What is their specific outcome? And we put it together in a sentence that helps them put together some other key ideas as well so that they're always able to know what exactly the outcome is that they're getting for people and who they're reaching and by what method they most want to reach them. Um, and that really helps give people clarity because I think clarity is sometimes missing for people when they're in business and it can happen at any stage. Even if you were clear before, you might have years go by and then suddenly you're ready for like a new level or new place and you realize you're once again in the space of feeling a little bit unclear about what you're doing. And it's, an iterative process that happens over time. Like we can still have a successful business for X amount of time and have a level of clarity. But then as we go on, we may shift what we do. We may want to offer a different style of program or have a different business model or help different people. And then we may need to go through that process of clarity again. And those kinds of phrases can sometimes pop up when we, when we don't feel clear about what it is we're doing. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. This is something that uh, comes up in speaking a lot because I think whether it is writing or speaking, the, the fundamentals, the foundation is still the same. We have got to understand who we are writing for, speaking for, and speak to them in a language or write for them in a language that they understand because it's not about us. It's about them. Exactly. Just like, you know, in, for coaches, you could talk about it, your ACC or PCC and a lot of, or ICF, and people will know what that means. But if people aren't coaches, they'll just say, what? They'll have no idea what any of those letters mean. And that, I think that's a good example for coaches to think about, like, you know, when they're writing for their audience. And you can use an acronym if your people will understand it, but if there's any chance they won't, then you'll need to spell that out for them so that they really understand. And you might even need to define it as well so that they really understand what it means. Because someone who hasn't studied something won't have the same deep understanding that another person has. So that's always important to keep in mind as well. Mm, yeah, yeah. And also during conversations, just cut out the jargon. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, jargon can slip in like ROI, you know, return on investment. And some of these things like don't resonate with people. You know, like if someone's a business coach and they start talking about that or even CTA, which is call to action, you know, I, I usually try to spell it out until I know that somebody understands it, you know, for working one-on-one -on -one or in a small group. Um, I think more people are learning what that is. But the point is, yeah, being careful about jargon and acronyms is 
is always a good idea. You mentioned something earlier that I thought was interesting, which was about writing every day. And mm -hmm. I think that I love to write every day and that's something that I do. I'm not always writing content every day. Sometimes it's just writing for me, but I do write a lot of content. And, um, and I was thinking that one of the challenges of it is, is getting into the right, being in the right mental state to feel passionate about what you're writing about can be a challenge for people because it's kind of like, it's kind of like if we go on a live video and we're like, hello, I'm, my name is Deborah, and I'm here, you know, like we're just kind of feeling, feeling very flat. It's not really going to resonate with people as much as if we feel excited. Like, you know, you and I are pretty excited. We're talking, we're kind of like, but we're not like this every minute of, of the day, 24 hours a day, right? So you have to do the same thing for your content where you get into the right emotional state. And you can do that by, some people like to take a walk. Some people uh, might do yoga. Other people might decide to listen to like, rock music because that gets them going or favorite songs of some other kind and then that gets them into um a really highly creative state where like the ideas are just coming and so i think that that's really important whether you write every day or not that's a that's a really useful tip for being able to get into the right space because when you feel very passionate about something that gives you the chance to really stand out like i was talking about in the example about bestsellers and and how i wrote my anti-bestseller post yeah. Um, I was kind of feeling it that day that I wrote, that I wrote about it. And I was kind of like, oh my gosh, I've got to let people know this. And I felt very strongly about it. And it kind of came through in the piece, you know, and I've written some pieces about, um, like losing people and then like how that affected my business and led into some of the work I do now with people. And that came from like a really passionate place as well. So I think it's important for people to realize having that emotion instead of sitting there like, oh, I have to write, oh, what am I going to write about? <laughs> And then it just doesn't feel good. And it, it comes out feeling forced. And I'm going to let you know something else. I don't know if this happens to you too, but it happens to everybody. No matter, no matter how long you've been writing, you're going to have that day where you're like, oh my gosh, I'm writing about this. And it's just not coming out the way I want. It happens to everyone and it's yeah. completely normal. It's not like you become a great writer and then that never happens again. So I just want people to know that. <laughs> and that's the day you would see a question from me. <laughs> Instead of going into a full post, I would just frame something around a question and uh, do a poll and then people can do the talking and the writing and I get away with it. Yeah, exactly. I love asking questions. They're so fun. Yeah. And it gives people an opportunity to express their opinion, get involved. It works both ways. Yeah, exactly. Like in my faith group, you know, in, and uh, in Facebook groups in general, it's so great to get people talking to each other because who knows what magic they might create. You know, it's a community. People might be meeting each other outside of it, become friends. Maybe they'll collaborate on something. And I think, or maybe they'll buy from each other. Maybe someone will become a client of someone else, which is awesome. Um, you just never know. And I think those possibilities can be so exciting as well. Yeah. Yeah. I really like what you said about the emotional state and knowing what works for us and, uh, when is our best time to create content? I want to add just one little bit input there. What works for me is aligning my energy to it. So because I create my content every day, I do it at a time when I'm feeling most awake. So I don't create my content in the evening or, or the afternoon. I know that my best productivity, my best sharpness is in the morning so that's the first thing i do every day and i think it's just important to understand what works for us some people may maybe night owls maybe that's when they create the best content and that's fine but we've got to really understand what works for us and and keep at it mm -hmm. definitely and you know it's interesting because i was just thinking um people talk a lot about morning routines and I resisted morning routines for a long time, and now I'm into it, and I'm doing it. <laughs> I'm a convert. But, um, but I was also pondering and thinking about how the morning routine, for me, actually starts the night before. Because to have a good morning routine, you have to have a good rest. And so that's something now, like, my morning routine is now sliding back through the night to the night before, where I feel like, okay, I'm going to set out my glass of water the night before, so I drink that when I wake up and feel hydrated and... I'm going to um, try to go to bed earlier and those kinds of things so that I can set up for the good next, you know, a good next day. Because like you, I like to write my content in the morning. And yeah. if I'm not feeling that great, then I'm probably 
not going to get up as early and be as productive? It's just that morning for me, writing content in the morning for me means nine o'clock or 10 o'clock. Mm -hmm. it, it, it doesn't mean a 5 a.m. or 6 a.m. No, I'm, I'm not a morning person in, in that sense. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, it's different for everyone and it's really important to understand what works for us and not really look at other people and be carried away. I think that's really, really important. I'm so glad you said that because I feel like there's this very strong message out there that we all have to wake up at four o'clock in the morning and that's just not going to happen for me because if I wake up before, if I wake up at that time, I've tried it. I feel horrible the rest of the day. So for me, it's better to wake up probably no earlier than 530 and six is good for me. Just to like, mm -hmm. I like to have my quiet before the rest of the neighborhood is up and just have it be peaceful. Yeah. Um, and then, you know what, if I don't feel like getting up that day, I just sleep because sleep's important. Sometimes like there's been noise at night or something happened and then I didn't get as much sleep. So I think the, the bottom line is aim for something and then don't feel bad if you don't, yeah. you know, if you miss a day here or there, it's totally okay. I feel like there's just too much pressure around like, you must do it every day or you're a bad person. And I'm just like, ooh, the pressure, I don't like that. So. Yeah, but I really like the point that you made about sleep because if I don't get a good night's sleep, then I'm, I'm a zombie the following morning. Where is that content going to come up from? It's just not going to work and it's not going to be as much fun. So, so yes, having that discipline and looking after ourselves is so important. It's, it's non-negotiable if, if we've got to do this. And, uh, and yes, you're right. There's so much pressure in the world out there that you've got to do it at five o'clock or six o'clock. Or do you have a morning practice? No, I don't have any of those things. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Brilliant. So tell us, Deborah, is there something that you're excited about or is there something that's coming up in your business? Any programs that you want to share with information about? Yeah. So the first thing is that I have a free Facebook group, which you are more than welcome for everyone to um, come explore. It's called the Anti-Boring Club, Write Content That Converts, and it's on Facebook. So feel free to find me there. And then, and I'll put links down below. I also have um, a guide for you if, you if you're feeling stuck with social media ideas. I've got a guide that takes people through, um, includes 21 social media ideas that can be used more than once. So it will give you lots of ideas of what to write about if you're ever feeling stuck. And it'd be great to see you in one of those places or other. <laughs> How can people get in touch with you? My, they can always email me at Deborah, D-E-B-O-R-A-H, at RadiantMediaLabs.com. And my website is RadiantMediaLabs.com. So they can also find me there. And you are on Facebook and LinkedIn. Yes, I'm on Facebook and LinkedIn. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> <laughs> because that's how we connected. Yeah, I love LinkedIn. I'm getting close to the limit for my Facebook friends. So you can always follow me there or join the Facebook group. And on LinkedIn, uh, feel free to send me a connection request and reach out. I'd love to hear from people and connect to them. All right. And when we finish this call, can you also drop all the links that you want to share with our audience just underneath this video so that we have everything in one place? I definitely will. Yeah, I'll be able to come in a, a little bit later and do that today. Yes. Great. Deborah, thank you so much for coming and talking to us. It's been a delightful conversation. Thank you so much for having me and thanks to everyone watching. I really appreciate having this time with you and getting to know you better too. Thank you. Bye for now. Bye all. <laughs>